and it's rolling and I'm going to greet everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good part of day basically depending where you're from. Uh, welcome to the uh, largest and the fastest growing uh, large scale scrum uh, meetup uh, uh, based out of New York City. I'm Gene Gendel, I'm going to be your host. Um, today I have a special guest that I would like to announce to, uh, to everyone. He's my colleague, virtual colleague uh, from, um, from Europe, from Germany slash Austria, I would say Wolfgang, right? I will not be mistaken if I did that. Austria, yes. Austria originally, yep, Austria. So Wolfgang is the founder of, uh, and the CEO of uh, JIPP, his own uh, company, um, Agile Change Agency, if you will. Uh, Wolfgang is a certified Scrum trainer and a certified less trainer which makes this um, a double connection between him and I, because we both are uh, a part of the same, uh, the same two communities. He has been a coach, uh, trainer, and organizational um, consultant since 1998. Uh, he's, uh, Wolfgang is also a, a doctor, has a doctorate degree, his PhD, and his doctoral thesis um, he did with the focus on project management, organizational structures, agile software development methods, and various interactions uh, between the above mentioned disciplines, uh, almost uh, 50,000 projects were involved um, in, in the overall analysis. Uh, Wolfgang's philosophy is a combination of theoretical background of practical expertise. And he has participated in over 100 projects uh, and programs in Europe, Australia, USA, as well as um, outs worked with outsourced teams in uh, uh, China and India. So uh, without any further ado, I'm going to pass the baton over to uh, Wolfgang. And um, he promised to me that this will be an engaging, entertaining, and funny discussion. I do have a few questions that I collected from the crowd in my back pocket. If people uh, run out of questions, then I will be happy to fill in the air. In fact, there are a few that I have a very salient. Uh, other than that, I'm going to let uh, Wolfgang uh, manage his time and, and the pace. Uh, over to you all, gang. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Gene. It's a pleasure to be here, actually. I mean, to be here in my own home office and virtually in New York City or wherever you sit at the moment. So it's just, I'm, I'm pretty new to this virtual cooperation kind of thing, you know. Uh, I'm pretty experienced with meetups around the world, but I think this is the very first one, actually, I do via Zoom. So... Bear with me a little bit if I make mistakes or if I have problems handling this this tool, uh, but you can help me out. I, I heard already there are some pros on this on this group here, so I'm ready to learn how to operate it better than I can do it right now. So no worries, we're all in the same boat. We'll give you some very good, very good. Yeah, I mean the topic for today is fake gas adoptions, and Gene forced me to add this ironic part to it correct gene that's correct i will uh, you know i think I, i'm all for irony and and sarcasm as long as it's in the midst of decency yeah. uh so yeah i did want you to to put a you know a, a nice funny um you know spin to this to make this a little more entertaining yeah. and uh, provocative yeah i think the provocative is the right word uh, word probably and uh, uh, irony is probably something else that connects us two together so not just scrum alliance and less but it's also i like to be a little bit ironic and that's what i tried to incorporate into this presentation in these slides today so but wherever you have a question wherever you want to stop me wherever you want to post something on the group chat feel free to do it anytime so this, I don't consider this as an interruption. I consider this as a contribution to our dialogue we probably have today. I'm not sure how many people are already on here. So probably I won't have- uh, any Almost 50, there, almost five zero. You have five, a good okay. crowd, I think. Yeah. But my apologies if I cannot connect to everybody directly today, but I'll do my best to give you some information about, yeah, about the topic what I prepared today at least. So, I think I need to do a screen sharing first. Yeah, there's a button down below. It says share screen in green. So if you click on it. So I hope you will see the, the slides in a yep. second. Nice. Are there? Yep. 
Fake loss perfect. adoptions with irony. Perfect, perfect. So that means then let's start with the I skip over the first two or three slides because Gene introduced me already. Yeah, something about my company, about my PhD thesis. And I want to jump right into the topic with the next slide then. Um, and just to give you a heads up first, what this is about, um, I'm planning or I will soon start to create a blog post series about the topic of product ownership. Uh, one second, let me ask everyone, I'm gonna mute everyone and I'll mute you, Wolfgang, because there's yeah. a lot of background in that. Yeah, I can hear um, some background noise at the moment. Everyone who joins, could you please put yourself on mute? Welcome. You you on mute. So you you on you on mute. Current. Yes. Excellent. Okay. You, uh, one second. Un, so, unmute. I'm, I'm, yeah. You go. You go. You good. Okay. So uh, the first slide, like I said, I want to start soon with a blog post series which is called the Product Owner from Hell. Yeah. And this is somehow also connected to yeah, fake gas adoptions in a way. I've taken some of these planned uh, headlines from the blog posts and yeah, let's see what you can take from this with you. Um, the product owner from hell is not only for less product ownership, it's in general for product ownership, but in a, in a less adoption, it's very much more important than probably in others. So that's why I selected this for, for today's, yeah dialogue we will have here for our conversation. The product owner from hell, and by the way, I think I need to do this disclaimer first because all the people or all the scenarios in here are completely fictitious, right? So this is not from the real world. I've never experienced that. So if you find yourself in there somewhere, it's not about you. It's not about somebody you know, it's fictitious. If you believe me that. <laughs> No, I don't, but it's okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we we all say that, but we haven't we we imply. Yeah. yeah okay. It, it's okay if it's done in a respectful yeah. way. Um, this is one of the statements the product owner from hell frequently can be uh, gives to his team. So this in future the business anal analysis group will do refinement for you, so you do have uh, you do have more time to produce code, right? Everything which is in these slides should be an indicator if it's a fake adoption, if you're not there yet, if it's not real less, something like that. So that's the idea behind it, right? So if we have a product owner saying something like that, probably in the first place, it sounds like a good idea, right? Because the team is able to produce more. The team is able to contribute better to writing code and so on. So, um, the first problem we have with all of that is, of course, there are no business analysis group in a real less adoption. So what should we do then with the business analysis? This is a question that frequently comes up when we do, a f uh, when we do less adoptions. <laughs> and one of the statements I heard, and this is from the real world, unfortunately, so we need to fire all the bus. I mean, there's a little bit of world play in here. So Buzz Water, one of the creators of the less adoption. So we all need to fire, uh, fire all of the business analysts. Um, not really, of course. I mean, you all know that. But this is one of the considerations which come up soon when we talk about we don't need these people. We don't need these roles, right? This is something we can observe frequently, or at least I did. Um, unless we say refinement is done by the teams. So the next consideration is then, does that mean we have now per person multiple roles in a team? Does that mean we have roles back in a team? Does that mean a person is a developer, a tester, and a business analyst at the same time again? Um, this is something when people get, yeah, probably a little bit anxious in teams. We need to do all of that. What we learned is now not really needed anymore, something like that, or we need to change a lot and things like that. Of course, there's changing required for people in a team, but we're not talking, still not talking about multiple roles, right? But this is, yeah, this is a dangerous one. 
this one I like the most. Um, the indicator that lines of codes is an indicator that much quality, much value is produced in a team. Um, we have one principle in less, which is called more with less. Yeah. If we would take lines of code, and that's my assumption, if we would take lines of code as an indicator to maximize value, then probably the principle would be more with more. Right? So that means less is one framework, but we could come up, of course, with another framework, which is called more. And then we could have more with more. And then it's about producing lines of code. So that's the causal connection I have in there in this consideration. So product owner from hell. Product vision, what do you mean? Um, unfortunately, this is something I really heard often. So we are producing something, but what is the idea behind it? What is the product? I mean, this is one of the central points in every less implementation, in every less setup, in every less organization. The product vision is so much core of all of that that there has to be, of course, one. If the product owner comes up with product vision, what do you mean? Then definitely it can't be really a, a less adoption. Then we are definitely in a fake less adoption. Um, there was a famous quote in Austria on Austrian television, a, polit, a, polit, a politician in Austria said, who has visions should con, uh, consult a doctor. So this was very for a very long time in the media in Austria, because of course we need to have visions. Of course we need to have gold. This is not a disease, right? A product vision is nothing that uh, is an indicator for an illness or a, a disease. No, we need to have that. We don't need to consult the doctor. We need to consult the client in, in the other, on the other hand, that we find out what this is all about. And of course, we need a clear understanding of the product vision so that a less adoption can really work. And the product owner, and not the product owner from hell, but the real less product owner should be, uh, should be able to present the product vision and explain it into, in a second. So for me, this is really an indicator. If I go to an organization, the first question is always, what is the value? How do you define value? How can you figure out what the sorting in your product backlog is? And what is your product vision? And very often the answers are something like, yeah, we have done 20 workshops for that. We have 200 PowerPoint slides. We have something like that. Whenever I get this information, then what came to my mind was actually I should put out the stopwatch now and see how long it takes for a product owner really to explain to anybody who comes into the door, okay, what is the product vision? This is an analogy which I took from, um, from Formula One because if a team is not able to do a pit stop within a under two seconds nowadays, it's too long. So what's the indicator for a product owner? What's the maximum amount of time will allow a product owner to uh, explain the product vision. That would be a nice, a nice experiment. I would like to try one day, actually. And value, maximis, uh, value maximization and product vision are heavily connected, of course. So, but on the other hand, what is the one that comes first? You know, this hand and egg problem. Is there the value that you need to define first? Or is it the product vision that comes first? Yeah. Is it important? I don't know. But actually, this is one of the things that came up to my mind when, when I do, when I did a product, um, uh, a less adoption actually in an organization, and they didn't have either or. So where to start with the value definition or with the product vision? So like I said, hand and egg problem. If we don't have the product vision, how can we create the, the, the factors, the criteria to define value? If we don't know what creates value in our organization, it, does it make sense to come up with a new product idea? Hmm. Interesting spin probably in there. So something else now going away a little bit from the product owner from all to the managers. Um, this is the problem when people have to work on multiple teams. 
because the skills are needed in different projects. We need the people uh, available. We need these skills for different clients, etc. All these arguments that come up then. So what does that mean for the team, for the team members? This means usually meeting hopping. So a new discipline if we introduce or adopt a new framework. So that means if you work in multiple teams, that means you also have to attend like two, three, or four sprint plannings, two or three, four sprint reviews, dailies, et cetera. So this is really then the new discipline, the new sports of meeting hopping. I really love that. Yeah. So unless, of course, we say teams, uh, team members need to belong to exactly one team. And what then else uh, comes up in the mind of managers I've met before, no, I've not, not met them before because they are fictitious, of course. Um, that means we need to hire so many more people. So it's about their skills and we can't replicate them. That means we need people with the same skills. We need to hire them. That means our company will grow to the double, to the three times, etc. Which of course is not reality because it's not about only their skills, it's not about their expertise, their super expertise, it's about a skill set that can be replicated and it's about mentoring, etc. Finding a way how to learn in the organization actually. If a company, if a management team thinks like that, for me, it's still in a fake adoption situation. So they haven't really got the idea of that yet. Uh, that's a tough one, I guess. No projects in less. And that's usually the response I get. But why do we need projects? I mean, we'll come to that later. But seriously, in less, if we do a real less adoptions, there are no projects anymore. Does that mean we can't have projects if we do less? Yes, we can have, but we are not there yet then again. And then the knowledge silos. Yeah, this is also one thing. This is the, uh, the reason probably, the cause, the root cause why people need to work in multiple teams. Yeah. And how can we get rid of knowledge silos? Firing them? Hmm. Interesting. Now, there are of course better ways than doing that. So, manager, we're still with the managers. Mentoring. If, bar, if mentoring is really part of a company culture, and you hear something like that, once we have completed the client request, we will conduct a lessons learned session and write them down to a wiki so you can avoid these mistakes in future. Um, that's an interesting interpretation of mentoring, definitely. What I came up with is a, a term which is called Nirvana, the so-called digital Nirvana, because that's what usually happens to these kind of lessons learned. So they get stored on something like SharePoint or whatever. And the father and probably get greater religion out of that. Call, call, I called it wikiism. So that means whenever something is stored in a wiki in a digital format, yeah, we're done. We're good. Yeah, we can follow it. Which is, of course, not the reality, reflecting the reality. Mistakes should be there to learn. So if we have learned something, if, if we have learned that we made a mistake, the next step should be, of course, that we correct it. But that's sometimes or most of the time contrary to what is learned in school. So this is also a little bit of a, a twist we need to make if we are still, if we're going to a less adoption. And mentoring is not something that we talk about once and store in a tool. No, it's an active and continuous ongoing activity, actually which creates usually the response, but we don't have time for that because we need to write more lines of codes, lines of code. So once again, this, this contradiction that we need to produce more instead of figuring out what creates more value, what to, uh, how to maximize value, what the product is really all about, what the features are we should keep or should uh, implement, all of that. And of course, mentoring is a bi-directional interaction. I mean, Bidirectional uh, interaction is by definition bidirectional usually, but if mentoring is really considered as something identifying, storing, and that's it, then it's of course not bidirectional. Mentoring should be really an active, ongoing uh, activity. 
like I said. Hey, uh, Wolfgang, I'm not sure if you want interaction yeah. or not. So my, my experience has been, I more frequently encounter the opposite, that okay. people say, oh, well, we're agile, so we don't document anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there is actually, I don't know if you know this joke, there is a, I think it was about Kent Beck, and uh, he, he told this joke, actually, that he went 15 years back to a conference, and he met a guy there and said, hey, uh, Kent, we are already agile now. And Kent asked him, oh, great, what are you doing now? You have product backlogs. Uh, uh, no. Oh, yeah, then you're doing dailies, probably. You're doing daily stand-ups or something like that. Uh, no, actually, not. You're delivering frequently. Not yet, no. So what's your, why are you agile then? We're not writing any documentation anymore. So I think this is really exactly what you're talking about. And yes, I've observed that as well. I know this, yeah. Um, but I think both scenarios exist actually, yeah. What I have observed very often is unfortunately that really lessons learned are conducted and also in retrospectives, people write down everything, store it somewhere on SharePoint full stop, nothing further. That's of course not what we're talking about if you're talking about Kaizen and continuous improvement, et cetera, yeah, from the Toyota production system uh, time frame, right? Um, yeah, no, that's, that's a fair point that if it's just uh, written there and then never referenced, uh, just as a counter example, uh, I was working in a large enterprise and it, it would often take days and days of research just to figure out what a, <clears throat> what a data element meant. Yeah. And uh, eventually through heroic efforts, we actually created a metadata repository and, and it was almost magical. You, you wanted to know what a data element went, meant you went yep. to the metadata repository and it was all laid out there beautifully and, and the organization was disciplined enough to keep it up to date. And it ended up being a huge help in increasing velocity. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have to pause and, and go hunting up and down the value chain for this expertise. The expertise was preserved there in this tool. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sorry, I was just a little bit distracted right now because I figured out there are many entries in the chat and the chat just popped up right in front of me right now. So I, had, I, I tried to listen to you and uh, in parallel read the chat. So uh, sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, ah, you're, you're demonstrating the perils of multitasking for us. Thank yeah, you. I'm trying to <laughs> get that all in my head at once. <laughs> well, again, just to make it easy for you, the, the, the unwritten... Um, agreement of this meetup and probably of others. Uh, if people want to ask questions, they have to explicitly make it short, succinct, to the point with a question mark, because we also welcome people exchanging, but not necessarily this exchange is for you to answer. Let, let yep. them talk. But if they want to answer, you answer a question, they need to frame it so, so yep. that we can pick it up from the, from, from the chat. Okay, no worries. Exactly, yep. Good. So, Next slide is also still with the managers. Um, what I've observed very often is this, this uh, mystery of self-organization or as we call it in less self-management. Um, it's pretty close. It's, I think it's not exactly the same, but it's pretty close. Um, when I ever hear, hear something like, we want you to self-organize, but the scrum master will take care of that. And please follow the scrum master's instructions. That's when I start listening a little bit more carefully what's going on there or observing a little bit closer. Um, because this is a mindset I've seen with some people, luckily not many, but some. So I give power to, to the people, but I am the people, uh, if you know what I mean. So I, I liked, uh, I tried to play a little bit with the words here. Um, in general, my, my assumption is actually that every team is self-organized regardless of the setup even if there is a team lead yeah even this is kind of self-organization if they accept a team lead right um 
self-management on the other hand is a, is a learning process and needs to be it requires support from a scrum master or an agile coach or whatever you want to call, uh, call this role um but it's not about instructions it's not about commanding people to self-organize it's not about uh, directing them to um self-manage and this fear that they don't know what to do i mean we are in an industry actually in which most of the people have some kind of academic degrees or some other kind of equivalent experience from practice or other educations or whatever so we all these people are very usual uh, usually very very intelligent and to assume that those people are not able to come up with some kind of self-organization or self-management i don't know i've learned otherwise so this is really something which is really really strange to me but i've seen that very often and unfortunately in, in organizations who said yeah we're already uh working with scrum we're going towards less now or even some other frameworks yeah and for me actually i say self-organization is more a statement to everybody it's not just to the team it's a statement to the end uh to anyone in the organization it's to the entire organization because self-organization requires a shift in power structures we need to understand differently what yeah how, where decisions are made who has some um of course also responsibilities will change so it's really a drastic change in my personal opinion in power structures and if we come from something which is a matrix organization, probably a weak matrix organization, then it's even larger, this kind of change. This is a term which was coined by my wife, actually, a couple of years back. And she's, she called this, this uh, behavior management by screaming. What does it mean, actually? Usually what, I, what we can see very often in organizations is who has the loudest voice will be served first. So the client who has the loudest voice or puts most pressure on a team or on an organization will be served first. So that means we're not sorting by value anymore. We are sorting by noise. Yeah, and she called that management by string. I, li I like this term a lot, so I kept it and I, I, I reuse it every time I have a chance to. But that means then, if we sort by noise, it would be good to have some voice training actually if you're on the client side. Because if we know that the organization will react on that, hmm, then it's definitely something we should be capable of expressing our needs loudly. I have now a chat, with a, uh, a chat entry with a question mark. Should I respond to that now, Gene? So you tell me the rules here, please. Yeah, you know what? I, I just I think you picked up the same the weak matrix organization. Uh, go ahead and um, answer answer it if you would like. Yeah, sure. Uh, Lancer, what I meant is uh, usually we have three different types of matrix organizations: weak, balanced, and um, strong matrix. A strong matrix means there is not so much interference between line organization and project program product management anymore so there it's much more clearer where the decisions are made in a weak organizational matrix usually and let's go back to a traditional uh, organization that means project managers are there to manage the project but they can be overruled overwritten every time from line management positions and how to, to switch that in my personal experience is just harder because uh people who have the power currently and that's according to the first uh of Lamen's laws which comes later actually um this shift in mindset is just much more difficult because you need to tell people you have the power now in future you don't have the power anymore yeah and you need to decide that for yourself and not many people are ready to that, do that because the fear of losing salary losing status whatever is is so high is so so much so often in the in the way of that i thank hope you. that answers it a little bit at least thank you 
You're welcome. So, um, we were, just to go back, uh, we were management by screaming now. And that means frequently changing priorities. Of course, that also means frequently replanning. That means probably within a sprint, if we're in a scrum setup, if we're in a less setup, that means within the sprint replanning. That means we don't have stable sprints anymore and so on and so forth. So all these kind of consequences. Um, of course, if we have management by screaming still in place, we probably need to come up with a better way of stakeholder management. And yes, even in less, we still have this. This is something we learned already in traditional project management, in traditional management practices, etc. But stakeholder management is definitely, definitely very, still very important, even with any other framework, I would say. So this is something I do in my Scrum courses and less courses also frequently because uh, I don't know where this comes from, but just because there's a framework which is called an agile framework now doesn't mean we have to forget of everything which is was in place before no it does just means we need to probably change our view on it a little bit more but not get rid of it if it's a good practice if it's something required and of course we need to have a clear understanding of the value which i already said so what else is probably indicating that we still have a fake adoption in place? Agile project managers. In Scrum already, and of course in less as well, we don't have any kind of project managers. So if we have something in place, which is an agile project managers, we are also not there yet. Yeah? And agile project managers, I'm not saying they can't exist. I'm just saying, they don't exist in less or in scrum right and of course agile project managers is not what we know from traditional project manager management this is really a different animal um this is very often the assumption i am confronted with we need projects because we need to be able to build the clients yeah we need to get our money from that of course that's not the only way so now a little bit of a thought play. If there are no projects in less, what do HL project managers do then in less? Hmm. Good question. I don't know. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> if there are projects in the less organization, why? Yeah, goes back to once again, we want to build a client. And I just take the third point first, and then I'll answer the next question here. If product development needs to be managed, yeah, how can this be done? Do we still need somebody who manages this? this or actually the answer is no, because we already have a product, product manager, we have a scrum master and we have team uh, members. And these three roles are considered to take up the uh, activities which are required for project management in a scrum and in a less environment. There was the question first, how do you handle agile project managers? Lancer, what do you mean by handling agile project managers? Usually the, the first step is people start asking you, hey, I'm a project manager. How do I fit into this agile mm. transformation you're discussing? So that's like the first part. Okay. Um, yeah um well if they want to stay a project manager the answer is simply you don't fit in anymore seriously <laughs> it, that's right. it that's it but uh project managers are usually usually i mean probably not everybody but usually well-trained people with a lot of knowledge a lot of uh, skills and so on so they probably would be really great in some other position, some other, or it could be either product manager, uh, product owner, it could be either scrum master, it could be either a uh, team member. I don't really know. So that it really depends on the, on the goals this person has. It could be also line management, of course. So it's a different setup. And I think there is enough to do for people with this kind of skill set. 
Yeah, I like, I, by the way, I like your answer. Um, I was in an engagement uh, on a large enterprise that was a strong matrix organization. And uh, one of the coaches had the courage to go around telling them, there is no, there's no role for project management in, in Scrum. He says, just look at the document. There's no, they don't talk about project managers. And, but then he was, after those meetings, he was always apologizing to the rest of the coaching office. Yeah, I hope I'm not creating a lot of trouble for us because I'm just telling them exactly what it says. Um, and, and it worked out. I, I, I thought maybe in a strong matrix organization, we'd get some push uh, back. But it never, it never happened because the, uh, the, the VP level people, uh, you know, they, they, they just wanted to have an agile. Uh, they're not married to project management. And so in this case, it, it, uh, it was a really nice way to have very clear communication and set expectations. Mm -hmm. So Wolfgang, would it make sense if you just, you know, said a few things about local optimization versus global optimization. And when someone says, you know, we need to have project managers because we have them organizationally, should it be treated as a local optimization for the role as opposed to global optimization for the, you know, better the goal of the organization. It's, I think it could be connected to that, of course. I mean, this could be one of the, uh, one of the reasons I, I think, I think I, I know what you mean by that. Um, in general, I don't know if, 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 if it's always the case that uh, uh, keeping the project manager role is a local optimization. I think it's very often that they probably don't have the right view on what team members. Yeah. It's, it's, the difference is pretty much the, the, uh, is the, the level of power different roles have in there. So that's the, the main differentiation. Okay. Good. Sorry, Gene. I interrupted. Yeah, so, yeah, I do have this one in the back pocket. If you want, I can throw it at you. Um, sure. Actually, I do apologize. It seemed like the recording was paused by me, unfortunately, not intentional, and then I restarted. So I'm not sure what how much we have recorded. But here's the question. Um, actually, there was a comment from someone with the question. Um, we are experiencing some very challenging times and referring to the COVID um, pandemic. And uh, some people, there some companies are inevitably um, have to ask people to go on leave. And, you know, some other things are happening to people, to individuals' abilities to, to retain pro, um, um, engagements and, 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 and uh, work assignments. So this gentleman actually commented, he said, um, basically, uh, as a part of, so a part of our organization is experiment with less and it seems that it's already so lean and so simple the org structure that uh no one none of us got impacted by uh this um you know challenging challenging situation so yes everyone is remote but that's probably not what we recommend unless but other than that just because they are the the, the organization organizational structure within a larger company the less product group was so lean there was no impact mm -hmm. so that's i guess if may i'm not sure if you have any comments uh, on that but it's it's it's, inter it's interesting that simpler organizations seem to be more resistant resilient to dramatic changes as opposed to big wobbly monolithic complex cumbersome organizations that's my uh, that's my uh, my experience too yes definitely i mean the more complex the more complicated something is the more uh difficult is it to adjust or or uh, yeah if something like a pandemic or something uh, starts i mean that it's, it's probably not just people sending to the home office then it's much much more and this is definitely also my observation yes absolutely i mean if you say pandemic, that's another slide I've created, but it's yeah, it's just one of these bonus slides. Um, because distributed teams, we don't recommend it. In in actually, it's it's a rule that team members within a team are collocated in less. So, but now we have this situation that in the pandemic it's impossible. Yeah, we want to stay healthy. We can't work together. We can't sit together in one room. So, um, what's the next best option? This is probably then the next question. So I, I think nobody says that remote work is not, not working. We can still achieve something. We can still produce something also with uh, video conferencing. I mean, we see it here. We have a video conference going on here and many people attend. 
uh, also in my organization, my company, we have we have everybody sitting in the home office and we still produce something. But uh, the social layer, the social aspects, and also the psychological layer underneath that is so dramatically different that to create a real team out of that, of our distributed situation, is a has completely different prerequisites, completely different requirements. And that's what we need, that's what we need to, uh, to take in consideration. We need much more direct, I mean, video conferencing or something like that. It's not about installing a tool like Gyro or something like that, where we see tickets floating around. No, we really need to talk more. We need to have this equipment in place that we hear each other well, things like that. But still, it's not the same. Like I said, on a social layer, on a sociological layer, and on a psychological layer, it's a completely different animal. And that means additional investment in that. That requires additional time for this. Yeah. Thank you for that. So um, we have five, six minutes past. So uh, I see lots of people have dropped. So uh, perhaps we're going to need to wrap, Wolfgang. Um, sure. On this note, uh, first of all, I, I would like to thank you uh, wholeheartedly for joining and uh, giving this very uh, engaging and very informative talk. And uh, hopefully, maybe I can I can have you back here in a few months again, sharing more stuff. Uh, thank you all for joining, and thank you for your great questions. Uh, we will um, definitely get the deck out to you, and I will take the blame if. Uh, a big part of recording wasn't uh, would will not be available. Hopefully, just a small piece. I hope I just just press that button accidentally. <laughs> but I saw a, a few minutes ago it was on pause. So, but in any case, whatever whatever we have, we're gonna get out to you. And uh, please stay tuned uh, to less uh, New York City meetup, and stay healthy and stay safe uh, to everyone. Thanks for joining again, folks. Thanks, Gene, for the invitation. Thanks everybody for showing up. <laughs> and the great. Thank you. All the best to all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.